Welcome back to Highly Respected. I'm your host, Scott Greer. Today is another holiday, apparently. <laughs> Somebody just told me this when I was about to record is that, uh, you know, it's President's Day today. I was like, what? <laughs> I forgot. Uh, it is a federal holiday, unlike uh, Valentine's Day last week, but we're still continuing on. We're still going strong. We don't, as you guys know, we we didn't observe uh, the quote unquote Martin Luther King holiday last month, so we're not observing uh, President's Day, even though we should more. It's a more important holiday than Martin Luther King. But you know, highly respected doesn't take these days off. We're working twenty four seven to bring you the content you love and enjoy, and we know that the people deserve their IQ bo- boost through highly respected. So we're gonna keep going on. Uh, may have some challenges. I'm not sure yet if we're going to record on Memorial Day, Labor Day, and July July 4th. I think July 4th is a Monday this year. Uh, we would not record on Christmas. We're gonna we're gonna enjoy the holiday, but uh, for other days like President's Day, uh, Veterans Day, uh, you know, a couple of the other ones. Uh, obviously, Martin Luther King, or Juneteenth is now a federal holiday. We're going to carry on strong. So today we've got two big topics we're going to mainly discuss and a cognitive elite question. Uh, the two are pretty obvious. They're the trucker convoy and the situation in Ukraine. So the first is we're going to go over the truckers in Canada, what's going on there. And there's a couple different topics I wanted to cover into this. So the first thing to bring up is that it appears the trucker convoy is over at the moment. Uh, it could restart. Uh, still a lot of support for people going on, but the main uh, blockades, you know, them blocking bridges to America and them occupying much of Ottawa or the area around Ottawa's Capitol building or Parliament building, whatever they call it, um, you know, that's over. They've cleared them out. Uh, We saw some unprecedented measures taken out against peaceful protesters. Trudeau was given emergency powers and was threatening to freeze the bank accounts of anyone caught um, supporting the protests or, you know, at the protests and hundreds of people. I think, you know, Ottawa police reported that there was like over 100 and there's probably many more people who had their bank accounts frozen over donations to the trucker convoy. Also, the trucker convoy, the whole donor list was leaked and was shared over Twitter uh, because uh, Gives and Go uh, had their files uh, hacked and hackers were able to release it. And of course, even though social media companies, these big tech companies say that, you know, revealing private information through um, illegal means such as hack is uh, against, goes against the terms of standards. Uh, But of course, these journalists were able to identify and share all this information about people from the hacks and you know twitter didn't censor them at all so you know i guess these guys are terrorists so they don't get the same uh, degree of freedom or, or protection that someone like hunter biden did because i mean you have to remember is that they censored news reports about hunter biden's laptop because they said this is a russian hack it wasn't a hack it was he left his computer at a tech hardware repair shop and he never came to recover it and the guy handed it over it's much more um uh, legally obtainable information i guess you would suppose or you would say is that it was less a uh, tawdry means of obtaining this information than a company you know hackers getting into you know another website and then leaking the information that's much more illegal and yet every every uh journalist was going after some like bakery shop owner who donated like uh, 50 bucks to the convoy and demanding why they would do such a thing. So it was a way to harass these people. So they really brought out the harassment mechanisms and also police in Ottawa, you know, began uh, roughing up some of the protesters as well. It wasn't as bad as what we saw in Yellow Vest. Um, what I've seen in other places, like I think if people for- forget is that if you remember the Yellow Vest protests from late 2018, early 2019, that they were really brutalizing these protesters. There were so many clips of like French police just whacking the shit out of these uh, French uh, yellow vest protesters using water cannons. There was a ton of people with serious injuries. Uh, There was a few injuries there. There was reports that, you know, a horse trampled somebody. Uh, That person turned out to be an Indian or or, uh, some from some Indian tribe. Uh, They first reported her dead. She was not dead. And, you know, police are claiming that they didn't trample her or whatever. 
And clearly the shock of like the horses plowing or going through the protesters uh, likely led to whatever medical condition she had. And then, you know, that's the type of things. And there were some broken bones or people reporting, but you know, it was like odd because like Canada is like, oh, this is this peaceful country. You know, everyone's just polite to each other and this is what they had to do. And uh, it's likely more the financial threats that were able to get rid of, that were able to disperse these people. There's still some truckers going out. They threatened to strike. And so we'll have to see what goes on from here. You know, it really did inspire a lot of people. It seemed to get more support from America, even though, I, you know, contrary to... Uh, some of the uh, convoy critics is that there were a lot of Canadian support. Most of the people they were doxing were donors in Canada. That may have just been that they, who they were looking at. Uh, they weren't going after Americans for that because they wanted to make people suffer and be punished. And like saying an American, like random American in like Arizona donated is like they know they can't harass this person in America, but they can harass and punish this person in Canada and threaten them with financial repercussions as you know the Trudeau government is saying we're going to threaten to um we're going to threaten to freeze your bank account and it's even the same with some of they're making other threats is that if you were at this protest they're starting to, you know it's a similar way what the FBI is doing with January 6th protesters that they'll just show random pro, uh, picture and they're like this person is a dangerous terrorist and they're just like some old guy wandering around they're not even accusing him of a crime it's just like wandering around the capitol and now they're doing that. The police in Canada are doing that. They're like, if we identify you, you're going to jail. If you ever showed up to this protest, you are going to jail. And it's really them trying to threaten and intimidate these people. And to a certain degree, it's working. So that's what's going on with Convoy. And there are, I, th I guess it'd be three parts to discuss on this topic um, that I want to get to on what has happened and what lessons we can learn from this. The first thing I want, I think we should need to learn from this is the threat of liberal authoritarianism. And I've talked about this in podcasts in the past. I've always said that, you know, the great, my greatest fear is that, you know, who um, Biden or Kamala can't run in 2024. So then they put in Gavin Newsom, Gavin Newsom wins, and he has the charisma and the uh, mental competence to unleash liberal, full liberal authoritarianism in America. And it could be accomplished because, and this week we could see this in Trudeau and the Trudeau situation in Canada, you know, a lot of conservatives, particularly American conservatives were appalled and horrified by the reaction, uh, justifiably so that the Canadian government had against the convoy protesters, you know, freezing their bank accounts, uh, beating them, you know, forcing police to beat them or, and, you know, arrest them and, you know, describing them as a terrorist and etc. And then we're like, this is outrageous that they're doing this. But Trudeau was able to do this. And it's almost it's almost like people saw him as weak as for not doing this earlier because he had the full power to do this because the entire media was on his side. Every institution was on his side. His political party was on his side. There were no institutional impediments to imposing the emergency powers. And there's all these people like, oh, this is, we need to do this to preserve our democracy. And it's the same way that they do it in Australia when, you know, they had the insane draconian COVID lockdowns they did um, over the winter and I'll show you over the fall and winter in Australia is that, you know, they were, the media was cheerleading this and the media was going after the protesters or people who were violating uh, the insane lockdowns that they had in Canada. And they were able to do this. They were easily able to impose these measures there because there was no real uh, institutional opposition. You have to look at what the Conservative Party in Canada is doing. Their old leader, their, resider, their leader did resign and the new leader is now more supportive of the convoy and much more opposed to the mandates and the lockdown stuff that you know the convoy was started over. But at the same time, the Conservative Party was very weak about this. Like the Conservative Party is like, oh, please don't, uh, please don't shut down the bank accounts. And the Liberals, that's uh, Trudeau's party and the NDP, which is even further left than uh, Trudeau's party, were all like massively supportive of this. Like we have to do this. We have to basically uh, do uh, get rid of these people by any means necessary. This is what we have to do. 
And there was no, like, the media cheered it on. Like, the media's like, yes, get, shut down their bank accounts as the media is busy chasing down some bakery owner who donated $50 and, and subjecting them to an inquisition about why they would give money to the Canadian truckers and forcing them to apologize and harassing them. So, you know, there was several elements going after the people who may have had any connection to the to the trucker convoy, and it was like fully unleashed. I think the one thing is that Trudeau is almost too weak of a person to do this. I mean, even when he sent the police out there, the police for for most of the time, and there's I'll get to this later on in the podcast, but you know, for the most part, the police were friendly to the convoy. Prior to last week, we're friendly to the convoy. A lot of the people, demonstrators, are like, yeah, a lot of police are saying we support you and, you know, they're being friendly and stuff. But, you know, that last few weeks of the government being like, you got to compensate their gas and whatever, you got to be harder on them. And then they push them into, um, you know, suppressing them. So it was very easy for the government to do this. And you could see this happening. Uh, very well in America. Uh, I think the difference is is that Biden is not fully mentally there. He doesn't really have much charisma, and he's like very weak point. I mean, he does, he has a bare majority in the Senate, a bare majority in Congress entirely. He can't really get anything passed. He, the Supreme Court is you know still um, you know has a conservative majority. So he's very he doesn't really have the power to do this. But somebody who you know was really able to capture you know, hearts and minds and really become a star in mainstream media could easily impose these stuff as like, you could see is that like anybody who supports President Trump's 2024 campaign, we're going to freeze your bank account because you are a threat to democracy. And they always use this like, this is a threat to democracy. It's like, how are the trucker convoy a threat to democracy? They're, 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 peacefully protesting they're peacefully assembling they're you know they're not really causing any harm i mean they're causing some economic harm by blocking the bridges but you know you know there's some demands that can be met and and that they should the government needs to do but they wouldn't do that and the government kept doing what it wanted to do even though the media always creates this fear of a right-wing strong man and a lot of our own side fantasizes about a right-wing strong man and what they can do with countries like Canada and America, it's a different situation in Europe, um, but really for most of the part of the Anglosphere, it is the real threat is a liberal strongman. Um, I don't think Trudeau, Trudeau fortunately is not that person, um, even though he does have most of the control. I think he's just like a naturally weak person who's he was very reluctant to do this. He eventually did this, but it's, uh, it is coming at a cost. I don't think it's great if it costs is the protesters thing because now, all these people are like, this is looking so bad for Trudeau that, you know, they're what they're doing to the protesters. But if you read any of the mainstream media reports, they're like, oh, they peacefully remove these guys. Of course, they're going to not have the videos of a cop using his baton against, a, you know, an old lady. You know, they're not going to show that stuff. But if you're reading the media reports, it's like, oh, they cleared him out without much trouble. Now peace has returned and democracy is stronger than ever. Thank you, Trudeau. So I don't know if they're necessarily going to have those elements. You know, the Canadian conservatives, particularly of of um or rebel news they're so funny i mean they're completely powerless but every time they're just like they act like they're like snarky tweak is about to, like to destroy trudeau they've been doing this for years i've noticed this like for years they're like um trudeau thinks he can do this um i think trudeau forgot something and they're like it's like trudeau and blackface it's like uh trudeau mm, you think you can do this but I don't think so. And then Trudeau does it anyway. They've kind of always had this like, uh, Trudeau doesn't want you to see this. Check out this photo. And it's like, nobody sees that photo. But they've always like kind of tweet in this way that like, they're like snarky tweet to, hey, at Justin Trudeau. It's like, oh, no, I'm about to have to resign. And it's not, that's not the case. I mean, we do live, unless the media turns on him, unless the institutions in Canada turn on him. Uh, that's not the, that's he's not going to resign and that's always what i found it weird is when there was people like saying like trudeau was about to resign it's like why <laughs> it's like it first off unfortunately canada is a very cuck country the majority of canadians support the vax mandates and some of the lockdowns i don't know to the extent that they like it in the federal mandates and there's clearly a lot of anger over that but you know there there 
Canadians do show this. And also, <laughs> there's a new poll that showed three-fourths of, of Canadians wanted the convoy protesters to go home. So a lot of Canadians supported uh, Tr Trudeau's harsh measures to get rid of them, unfortunately. And I think that's something that we have to keep in mind. It's like Canada is a very cuck country. Uh, you know, cuck, Canucks, more like cucks in general. If you know what I mean, that's really creative, of course. Uh, but that is the thing. And going back to the liberal authoritarianism point, yeah, in America, you can see this very similar thing. It's like the media is always de demanding a more extreme response. Like in January 6th, like, you know, there's several media commentators who are like saying that you know, the government should have used police to like open fire on these people and they would have totally supported it. And they even supported like the one person, you know, Ashley Babbitt, who was killed by a cop by, and she wasn't threatening anybody. They're like, this was the bravest thing a cop has ever done. Like, thank you for shooting Ashley Babbitt. And there's even further evidence that they're finding another person who they claim died of a of a drug overdose it is more likely that she died due to injuries sustained by police beating her. Um, at the protest and it's likely that's the same with like every other person every other Trump supporter who died but it's like the media's like oh awesome we love this like look at this dangerous terrorist about to like destroy our democracy and then brave Capitol police officers take her down and that's like what they're going to frame this as and they can frame anything like that and it just takes it just takes a little bit more of a majority and a much more mentally active president with who is also has much more of his charisma in place who can do this and i think someone like gavin newsom could be like that could be that person who's a liberal authoritarian and i've always said that and if you're looking at the canada example is if that you know if that if they have a situation that they can claim that <clears throat> democracy is under threat our freedom our way of life is is could possibly be destroyed they could easily do the same measures here and the only hope that we have is that our court system is a little bit better than canada and the republican party for all its problems is much better than the conservative party and there are some other and there's some other roadblocks too that we have that Canada doesn't. I think one thing is that our people aren't necessarily as cucked as in Canada uh, as well. So that's just something to keep in mind is that the fear of liberal authoritarianism is very real. It can happen throughout the West. Uh, fears of a fascist strongman coming to power are overblown. And really what we're going to get is something lame and cringe like the Justin Trudeau tr dictatorship. Have we ever had a reversion from democracy at this point in time so that's something to keep in mind from that the second point is the trucker success and i don't know if i want to say failures but limitations is a better way to say this the convoy was fairly successful they did force all these provinces and localities to change their mandate to ease up on their mandates ease up on the regulations uh throughout the country even in ontario they did that and Ontario was like, well, you know, we're not doing this due to the convoy, but we're doing it anyway. They didn't necessarily get the federal regulations uh, removed, but I can see that they can maybe ease them up later on due to the convoy. They just don't want to admit it's the convoy's um, the reason why. And it did have like a major effect and it was like peaceful. It gained a lot of support. It annoyed all the, all the right people. It was a big success for what it for what it did. I think, and it was like a it's very inspiring as a white pill, and I think you know they deserve the full support. Even though some people are like complaining, like oh, it should be over something more important. It's like, well, this is affecting the daily lives of million, of all Canadians, and you know was able to rally around a, a lot of support, and you know it did show a rebellion against their corrupt leaders. So for that alone, you deserve its support. But the limitations. I think, or, or thus, or this is that one Canadian Canada's population is cucked. Um, there is a strong minority that was willing to rise up and fight against these mandates, but there was even much more so than America, a much larger majority that was against them, and this did hinder a lot of their ability to get fully what they want because i mean i mean trudeau didn't want to give in to them because they feel like a lot of people were able to be convinced that this is just a tiny fringe minority that's trying to steal away what we want and make us less safe so we're going to be we're going to oppose them no matter what so there was that popular groundswell to crush the truckers in a way that 
Um, you know what did hinder their ability to fully succeed and stay there and to get what and to get to rein the concessions from Trudeau that they fully wanted. So that's one thing is that Canada is unfortunately a cut country, and then if you do anything great, the majority of the people are going to be against you. The second problem, and this is probably related to the first, is that there was no institutional support are for this and that also created problems is there was no real political party to represent their interests i mean it's the conservatives sort of did at points but the conservatives also spent more of their time condemning like the lone confederate flag they saw at these protests i mean that's what their previous leader did he w- issued you know these really strong condemnations of the confederate flag and very few passionate responses about what the truckers demands were and so they didn't really have that they didn't also, their the media situation is even worse in Canada. I mean, they really just had like rebel news. That's it, like on the media on their side, and you know the rest of the mainstream media just like absolutely hated them. They did not have a Fox News, and they did not have you know, and like the Canadian population is cucked. So. They just didn't have that institutional support to really push through them and defend their interests and to make sure that they're represented and heard. Uh, you know, it's just them. It's this grassroots effort. And this is like, a, I guess, the third problem is that they weren't able to develop like effective leadership or really organize in a way that it becomes clear. I mean, they did have very obvious demands. It's like in the mandates, in the restrictions, uh, the you know, that's pretty simple. I mean, it's not like they needed it, but I don't think it's going to carry on long term because the people who there was no real political, there was not real clear leadership. Uh, it, it was a very grassroots thing based on a very simple thing that could be taken away Um like their whole protest could be taken away by the government e- easing the restrictions and eliminating the mandates. That's all they want. And you could immediately end the, the protest that way. And there's not really, you know, they weren't really looking towards any leaders. I mean, especially not from the Conservative Party. They did have people from the People's Party of Canada, which doesn't have any representation. They're the uh, further right party of Canada. They, they're... They're kind of goofy and all over the place. They're pretty good on. They're very good on immigration. They're very libertarian, but they have very uh, boomerish aspects about them. But they even they weren't able to reap um, the benefits of support for the convoy in a way. It was just like a completely grassroots thing that was on its own. It wasn't it was good. It was not able to be co opted, but I don't think it'd be directed towards anything else. Like say you know, protesting Canada's insane immigration policies, which they're, they're trying to increase immigration. They're trying to like, we just, we just made a record of immigration. They have like, they have, they're trying to get over 400,000 immigrants there uh, every year. And and that's a lot. That's way more of the population um, than America. I think, you know, Canada is like what, 30 million people or so. Uh, It's probably a little bit more than that. And 400,000, you know, that's way more than America's like limit of a million, which we've been having less than a million uh, for most since most of the Trump years. Uh, Biden's trying to correct that, of course. But, uh, you know, we can (laughs) that 400,000 a year is like (laughs) insane amount of people that they're taking in and they're really just trying to replace people. And that's also something they were able to do against the the truckers is a lot of the trucking industry is now immigrant. It's the same here in America, but even much more so than in Canada. And they're looking at these protests and like, oh, this is a reason why we need more immigration. And a real thing that I think it failed is that Trudeau did have an effective counterinsurgency strategy against this. I mean, if they view it as an insurgency, they did have a decent way of counterinsurgency is that they made some concessions, not on the federal level, but on the province level, locality level. Uh, They did make concessions. Then they did, you know, they were like, okay, we're going to ease up. And the government did say, you know, claims like, oh, we'll eventually ease up, you know, whatever. And so that was it. So, so a lot of the popular support for this were like, oh, it looks like they're coming to our senses. Like maybe the convoy can just go home now. You know, it's trying to convince the popular support around it that here we're going to give you stuff, but, you know, we want the convoy to end. And a lot of the ordinary people who, you know, may be backing the truckers, may be giving them money, are beginning to like, oh, it looks like they're coming to their senses. We no longer have to do this. But at the same time that they're making concessions, they're coming down hard on those who are not accepting the concessions and are the hardcore of the insurgency. 
And this really did work to their advantage is that they were able to isolate the hardcore of the insurgency. They were able to dampen the popular support through it, through these, you know, concessions. And they were able to isolate them and to crush them. And that, I mean, they, it worked last week, unfortunately. And so that's something to, to also that happened is that they were able to easily be isolated. I think in a lot of ways is that they didn't have clear leadership. This is a grassroots movement. It's just like random people coming together. I mean, it's like very much against these notions that it's like an astroturf movement of some, you know, Putin or something. He's directing it. You know, nobody was directing it, but that did make it a problem for, you know, it's easier for, you know, a highly organized government to suppress it when, you know, it's not, you know, it's free form and, you know, people don't really know what to do next and it's not really taking direction. It's just like sitting there with the trucks. I mean, it doesn't have simple demand. They would have gone home if they had met their full demands met, but the government able was able to have a counterinsurgency strike uh, strategy that was able to neutralize them to a certain extent. They still may come back. They still may be more in the works of the trucker convoy. Uh, we'll have to see. We'll keep an eye on it. So that's it. The, the third part is something I'm going to go more to go off on, and it's the American conservative response to the trucker convoy. And I want to, as I made note, I'm very pro convoy. I think it is a white pill, and it is it's inspiring to see this in a, a country like Canada. But when I see American conservative responses to it and I see the lessons that they're taking from this, it's encouraging more of the fantasy and delusion uh, that is really predominant among the American right at this moment. Like if you were reading, I, I couldn't stop. I Like over the weekend, over the last week, I was in the weekend, I was like, I can't read any more about trucker convoy stuff, especially for American audience, because it's completely divorced from reality. It's it's <laughs> and their solutions and responses is just like it, it's like a comic book version of reality of what I was seeing. And I was just like, I'm going to focus on Ukraine. People are talking about Ukraine are actually talking about real things, real possibilities and stuff. And and when I'm looking at the American conservative response to the trucker convoy, I am seeing complete delusion and fantasy. So. When they started cracking down on the truckers, they're like, American conservative response was, you need to go on strike or even or even further, go on a guerrilla war. And there was all these like people were like saying, if they crack down on nine violent protests, that will lead to a violent revolution. I was like, um, no, <laughs> I don't think so at all. Like you have to think of like what happened after January 6th. It's like they cracked down on that protest, which was mostly peaceful, truly mostly peaceful uh, for the most part. I mean, yeah, of course, there were some skirmishes with cops. But judging by the media standard of Black Lives Matter protests, which were burning down entire cities and, and, and police stations, and then seeing what was happening January 6th, for the most part, most of the people were engaged in it were just walking around the Capitol and taking selfies. That's it. And the government arrested uh, over 700 people, and, you know, they cracked down on it, and... Uh, you know, surprisingly, there was not a violent revolution afterwards because generally crackdowns and suppressions work and people are trying to get in this mind. It's like if they crack us down and suppress us, they'll make us even stronger. And, um, you know, that's not how it works. I mean, I think people think that from movies and stuff is that, you know, if you do this against people, yeah, you're going to get like a, a more violent response. And there are examples of this where there's like a, you know, somewhat of a violent pushback and then it increases stuff. But that's usually because a larger party is backing the protesters, say, looking at the Maidan situation, which will cover Ukraine. Is that the Maidan, you know, eventually started as a peaceful protest. The government, you know, began getting rough with the protesters. Then it became more violent. Well, you know, when you have the world's most foremost superpower backing your protests and able to send out uh, CIA agents to, you know, help arm and train them, you know, you're able to uh, uh, affect and you're able to get institutions on your side, not just, you know, they had domestic institutions on their side. And of course, many global institutions on your side on their side they're able to have a different effect. But when you're just like an isolated group that has no institutions on your side, uh, especially no like, you know, no <laughs> intelligence agency on your side who's able to arm and equip you, you know, this is just like fantasy talk. So people are just like really insisting to like Trudeau, you better watch out what you're creating. You're you may have a violent revolution on your hands. It's like, 
Uh, no, and then, like the Canadian people aren't even on the side of, for the majority of them aren't even on the side of the trucker convoy. So it'd be, you know, they'd be even more supportive of, of harsh crackdowns if they even turned violent. Uh, so there's no point to that. Some people are making that point is that it's going to make them more isolated. Some of them were making the more ridiculous point that it's going to uh, lead to violent revolution. But are they going to have like guerrilla war against them? And I was like, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they're going to lead to guerrilla war. The strike thing is sort of realistic, but I they overlook the what happens to the strike is that this is not the majority of truckers who were... Uh, you know, involved in the convoy. A lot of truckers were, and I could guarantee you, and it may have been a majority of Canadian truckers, you know, had sympathized with the protest, but the people engaging, it was not all of Canada's truckers. It was a lot of them, and a lot of, and probably, possibly a majority, or, or a plurality of truckers did sympathize, but it was not the majority. And now they're encouraging them to go on strike, but this, once again, is a, the people who would likely go on strike are the minority who are going to do this? In order to have a strike, you need at least the majority of the, or or a, or a sizable number of them to you know ensure that they can't be easily replaced and their demands can be met. That's how like strikes works. When a when a whole workplace goes on strike, it's not like five. It's not like ten people out of a hundred they're going on strike. It's the whole like assembly line. That's how strikes work. But what they're like saying is like to go on strike, they just need 10 out of the 100 to go on strike. And that's, that's what's going to happen. No, what's going to happen. And the difference with the convoy is that they were making themselves heard. They were blocking off, you know, parliament, the parliament building. They were blocking off uh, important bridges to America that, you know, the trade that Canada's trade depended on. This is how they made their message heard. Instead of going to strike, it's like, Oh, John is not showing up for work today or he's not doing it. We're just going to fire him and we're going to replace him with an immigrant because we're bringing in so many damn immigrants into this country. That's what's happened with the strike. You know, in order to have a strike, you need the majority of the workers on your side to go on strike. Not just a few where they could just isolate you and then fire you. But that's how like a lot of like strike ideas work. I mean, there's been like so many people like suggested strike ideas in America and it's like, this is not this. Is, I mean, say what you will about unions, but unions are able to do effective strikes because they're ensure they are able to ensure that at least the majority of the workers are a, a significant number of them where it hurts the company are able to go out and the company is not able to get what it's produced uh, here. You know, it's they would easily, you know, the majority of truckers would still be carrying on and the ones who are on strike would just get fired and replaced by immigrants. So I don't think that's why the convoy was different because the convoy was using tactics. It's like we don't have a majority of truckers, but we have enough that we can block off a bridge or we have enough where we can keep honking at parliament and in the capital city and make our voices heard. We have enough people for that type of protest, but they don't have enough people for a strike. So it's a different tactic and it will just lead to these getting people getting fired and then people further ignoring their interests. And they would love nothing more than to ensure that these people are permanently unemployed. So that's not very realistic. But probably the worst aspect of the Canadian reaction is once again, it's encouraging anti-police anti attitudes. And I know I'm going to get so many groans is that because a lot of people have been convinced themselves that the really big brain take is to be anti-cop. Because they're and they're going to use that what's happening in Ottawa as an example for why cops should be defunded here. And sure enough, that's what's leading to the result is that Really, the two big things that I've seen the result from is that it's encouraging more national war slash civil war fantasies on the right. And it's encouraging more of the mainstream right to be uh, support to fund the police or like say like Black Lives Matter has a point. Uh, Lauren Southern, which I corrected, uh, did that. She's like, I think Black Lives Matter had a point about police. And it's like, you know, not, not really, because you have to think about this is that one. Uh, supporting Black Lives Matter. Whenever people like say this, they're like, "Well, Black Lives Matter to fund the police is not the not what I'm support. I support this fantasy solution that has no fucking chance of ever getting passed." But here's what we're gonna do: we're going to create, uh, we're gonna eliminate police, and then we're gonna tell the federal government to back super base 
paramilitary Patriot Defense Forces to replace the police. And they're going to be privately owned. And, and people can choose whatever uh, super base paramilitary defense force they want. And it's like, this has no fucking chance of happening. You might as well just talk about how you want fucking Superman and Batman to protect you from criminals. And that's what most of these motherfuckers are talking about. I'm so sick and tired of like this anti-police stuff. Because it's total fucking fantasy. All it is is these motherfuckers who have no experience of street violence ever. Thinking they can be motherfucking Batman against Latin gang and gangbangers and they'll go out as like I'm armed and it's like AR-15 like come at me criminals and it's like you're not a fucking criminal you have no experience of street violence criminals do if you didn't have police criminals could just prey on innocent people because innocent people don't have the time to dedicate themselves to thinking about violence and and dealing with gangbangers and so what they now expect is that individual citizens will just magically turn into fucking Batman and will be able to defeat criminal criminals on their own one-on-one -on -one. and this is what these guys are talking about it's like they're like you're a fucking coward for not taking on a street gang by yourself it's like what like where do you fucking live you watch too many fucking movies that's like what the right like the american right is now when you look at their analysis of any situation for a lot of the right i mean not everybody but like when i'm on twitter i see it is total comic book fantasies and when it comes to police, when it comes to solutions to like what should replace with police, it is totally divorced from reality. If you look at libertarians, if you look at like that guy Dave Smith, they're like, we'll have private self-defense based uh, patriot force that will defend you. And it's like, uh, how is that going to work? And the, the, first off, the people's complaints go down to this is that one, police did not like use brute force against Black Lives Matter. Uh, that's their complaint. So we need police to do that. But we also need police to not even shove protesters that the government is ordering them to do if they're right wing that they like if police are ordered to do something by the people who pay them that they need immediately like go and like kill them or remove them. And it's completely in, in the fact that they don't like launch a revolution on their own just means we have to defund them so citizens can take power on their own. And it's like one, the government is never going to allow itself to eliminate people who are able to suppress people they view as a danger to governance. They're never going to do that. And whenever people talk about like citizen self-defense patrols or whatever they're wanting to say, I was like, what happened in the Ahmad Arbery case? There were three citizens who acted as their neighborhood defense patrol. They took out someone and they thought it was a threat. What happened to them? You know, and this happened in a local rural area. And all these people, like I get all these uh, people on Twitter who are like, let's see them try that in my rural town of 500 people. I want to see Antifa take us on. It's like, first off, why the fuck is Antifa going to come to bumfuckville, middle of nowhere, to, to like, uh, take on anything? Like, what is there to, to take over? Like, you're not even near an interstate. There's easier ways to ensure that their area follows your rules. They don't need to send people out there. And so they're like, but they pretend that these areas are, like, Fortress America, and that they're able to do what they want. Well, the McMichaels did that in a rural Georgia town. Is very conservative area. Guess what happened to them? The state and federal authorities came in and arrested them, and they even they're now even charging the prosecutor who didn't bring charges against them. Like that's what happens with self citizen self defense patrol. It's like that is completely unrealistic to happen if you don't if you try to take matters in your own hands. You're going to have what happened to Kyle Rittenhouse. And people want to say, like, oh, Kyle Rittenhouse shows that we can do this. It's like, Kyle Rittenhouse had to spend millions of dollars and have his, like, name ruined and have, like, people try to threaten to kill him. People are going to try to threaten to kill Kyle Rittenhouse for as long as he lives. And he had to spend millions of dollars to ensure he wasn't in jail for the rest of his life. That's not really a victory for uh, self-defense, like, outside of police. And it's the same with, you really should look at the McMichaels case and Jake Gardner, the, uh, the I think it was an Omaha uh, bar owner who got attacked by Black Lives Matter mob and he shot somebody. You know, those are the type of cases you should see. They're going to come down hard on you and they're going to ensure that you're punished for doing this they're still able to do that like the government is not going to be tricked into removing cops and then it's like now it's like oh conservatives can now take over and like 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 immediately cops are taken over and the patriot defense forces take over america like there's no way the government could do anything it's like that's not going to happen it really just means that criminals would can now do whatever they want as what we're 
seeing in many major cities throughout the country where police aren't allowed to do anything. You could have even seen this in Portland where Antifa now controls the city. Like police can't even investigate murderers or anything. If like Antifa gets in the way, they can't even do press conferences because if Antifa says no and people are like, well, in my fantasy, the Patriot Defense Force would or Batman would. No, it's not. And like citizens are busy focused on working, raising their families and are on their other things. Many citizens are not capable of self-defense and you want to attack them and stuff. But it's like if you're working like several hours a day at a job and you come back home and you're like, ah, well, I guess it's my turn to patrol the hood now because that's part of my citizen self-defense position. Or you're thinking that only citizens need to protect their own property. It's like, well, a lot of like what if you're old and, and feeble? Like who's going to protect you? Like, uh, but so it's all like based on fantasy. I'm tired of these like idiots. And like anytime that like their two biggest complaints are like police were not like did not act like fascists against BLM, and then they acted like fascists against uh, the Canadian truckers. And it's like, well, <laughs> you know that like shit happens. And, and this is like in a Canada situation. This is in America. And see people anytime they look at like something like a cop hit someone in Europe. And like half of conservative Twitter is like, we need to abolish police. And uh, I'm just so sick of it. And the real thing that goes real in my mind is that all these people are always advocating for the most extreme position and like revolution and, you know, insurgency and guerrilla war. And none of these people have any stakes in this. They're like demanding that Canadians like do all these things that could put their lives at risk, that could put them in jail forever. And these guys, these conservatives are saying this, are living in blue cities. They're going to their foodie restaurant. There's one person in particular, I'm not going to name him, but this person who's like demanding uh, they go on strike and guerrilla war always complains about how his uh, um, very blue city has really bad traffic as he's going to like foodie restaurant and then he tweets about how his cappuccino, uh, his great cappuccino machine he has, and his final collection, and he always complains about traffic. And I, like one day he had this, he was like tweeting, it's like Canada, it's it, truckers, it's now time to collapse Canada. And then like later that day, he's complaining about traffic again, <laughs> like as he's going to his like uh, foodie restaurant. And it's like, you guys have no stakes in this. And you guys have no experience of like the costs and consequences. You guys just tweet and imagine that your tweets translate to real world action and shows how badass you are. And everyone in those like right thinks that like power is about how hard you tweet. It's like, if you just tweet that the government can do like, can, uh, you know, invade Canada. That's all the other dumb thing is like, now all these people are demanding that like, we send Tr Justin Trudeau to the Hague for his crimes against this. Like, you have to think of like, if Justin Trudeau was sent to the Hague or like, was like arrested or whatever for like what he did against the protesters, they would do that to any like mayor or police chief who did anything against BLM or Antifa protesters here. And they'd be much more likely to do that here. And it's like completely insane. Like the UN would never do this. Like the UN is more likely to pass a, a resolution praising Justin Trudeau for his reaction to this than to put him on charges of crimes against humanity. And people are just like, you know, uh, like Republicans must pass sanctions on Canada for this. And it's like, you know, if we started passing sanctions for police brutality on anything, like I'm not supportive of it. I think, you know, they, there could be like a America condemning it. You know, it would be nice if we had a Republican president. I think if Donald Trump was, was president, he would be condemning this and that would make Canada look bad. But um that's like it but if you like have these formal ways it's like they would like the rest of the world wants to investigate us for police brutality and racism and stuff and <laughs> we have no response to that i mean the un is actually currently investigating us for police racism it was something invited by anthony blinken and this is what it is you know so moving aside like going back to the fantasy talk like uh i i think is a lot of this is populist saying commentators. A lot of this is just like normie boomer cons. And a lot of what you see on Twitter is like, it doesn't give you a realistic solution of the problem. It doesn't give you realistic alternatives. It's just about hyping up stuff for engagement and not giving you uh, an accurate view of this stuff. And like the police stuff and the civil war stuff 
that these two fantasies and delusions that are already prevalent on our side are now just being increased by the trucker convoy. Are people wanting to do this stuff? Now it would be cool if we could do that stuff. I don't think a trucker convoy would translate into America primarily because the people who are most likely to engage in it live in areas where there's no restrictions at all on COVID. Really the only problems we have is that is like the masks in schools and a few liberal cities that still have these restrictions. I mean, there's some few some states like Oregon and California, maybe I think Massachusetts, but you know, that's like a very few places. I mean, this is not where your grassroots blue collar uh, working class revolution is going to come necessarily come from, uh, from a convoy. So I don't necessarily think it would translate, but I think that style of protest that the truckers did do is like, doing peaceful protests that, you know, they can't ignore and ignore, annoys them and disrupts their way of life. You know, it's really good. I, or like, you know, cops going on strike or something like that. I think that's like, that's like a very good protest mechanism for doing. Um, but so I hope that people learn those, but there are lessons that you need institutional support for this. And you probably need people who will serve as leaders better to direct your goals and to negotiate in order to do that. And I think those were some weaknesses there. And you do need to ensure that the government is not able to affect, uh, impose an effective counterinsurgency strategy against you. But when it goes to the fantasy, uh, but I don't think people are going to learn those lessons. Instead, people are going to learn the lessons of uh, it's time for civil war. It's time for national divorce or something. I don't know how that's going to work out. And we need to abolish police because if we abolish police, then the uh, Patriot self-defense forces can take over. And it, it's living in fantasy la la land. And when somebody says that, if people are saying that stuff, you are better off reading a Batman graphic novel than ever listening to that person's political persuasion again because those people are not uh, it's completely divorced from reality and i find this more often is that the right seems uh i mean just not it's not just the distant right it's it's a lot of it that this is is populist ink but it's like the right in general just like mainstream conservatives everyone it everything they suggest is just like what what planet are you living on and the the increasing support for defunding police is the dumbest fucking thing i can imagine first off as i said about um about you know these people wanting institutional things like the one funny thing about all these people who want like civil war or national divorce is that they want to abolish the gop and police and those are literally the only two institutions we have well police unions not police themselves necessarily the, but if you're abolishing police you abolish police unions and a lot of these idiots want to abolish police unions and keep police you're literally abolishing the only two institutions we have that are on our side. And you're not offering anything in place. You're just tweeting to sound like you're smart and for engagement. And that gets people to retweet you. But people aren't uh, thinking through this thing. And so, yeah, that with, uh, you know, it'd be total chaos. If we just like criminals, what we'd have is anarcho-tyranny if we defunded police. Is what we'd have criminals running our lives on a daily basis. But if we tried to resist... If we tried to like have a protest against crime, they would send out, they would find some form of police to, to send out and crush us. And that's really what the scenario is because unlike us, Black Lives Matter and the Democratic Party who are actually promoting to fund the police have institutional support. They have actual policies. Meanwhile, we're just pretending that the uh, Patriot self-defense Batman would protect us all from crime and would crush criminals if we just didn't have police. And it's it's just a fantasy. It's just people always like, ch you know, chest thumping all the time. And that's what a lot of right wing Twitter acts uh, operates at this. So I had to go I had took off my go off juice, but. Uh, you're thankful that it didn't do this on on Saturday. There was at one point at Saturday when I just saw all these anti-police stuff. I was like, I am so furious with this. I'm so done with this fantasy talk. And like, yeah, it's the comic bookization of worldview of the right is just ridiculous. I think uh, maybe it is like effect is that too much of our movement is based around Twitter is that we just like, you know, we're too busy like sharing takes with one another. Uh, I'm guilty of this as too, and it's we do need means of communicating, and we're, there's not really much for us to rally around at this moment. So that's why a lot of people are feuding and, or engaging in fantasy, uh, fantastical delusions. But 
you know, people need to keep realistic. You know, people actually, this is one situation where defund police, you need to touch grass because otherwise, like, people never think through this and all they do is call you a bootlicker and say you're a coward for not, you know, confronting a street gang on your own late at night for some reason. And they just imagine that all these guys who are working office jobs or whatever, and they come back home tired and they just want to sit down and relax are just going to go out and, you know, defeat crime on their own. They don't need cops. And it's like, that's not how it works. It's like, look at how, societies without, like, law enforcement that people protect or respect are, you know, extremely violent societies that are not and extremely dysfunctional. And we also don't even have, like, like, if you look at some of these, like, tribal societies or, like, some of these societies in Central Asia or, like, or the caucuses or something like I'm thinking of this is like where it's like law enforcement isn't uh, to the aspect of America. You know, they have these like clans and leadership and this leadership outside of like normal government parameters that is able to keep a lid on things and keep people from like feuding and like negotiate things and also ensure that there's like, you know, certain troublemakers are dealt with. Uh, we don't have any of that outside of what the government offers. It's not like there's like, uh, some institution that can resolve these disputes between like communities and ensure uh, troublemakers are dealt with. There's none of that. And you just have like the courts and you have police in America. And some people want to deal away with police and thinking that something is going to replace them. Yeah, it's going to be criminals. It's going to be Antifa. It's going to be Black Lives Matter people. It's going to be people that the institutions have no problem with. And it's not going to be people that the institutions have a problem with. If it, it came to be replaced like citizen defense forces, they'd send the soldier, they send the troops, they send the FBI, they send whatever. And anyway, what the main thing to realize with these anti-police things is that whatever base idea you have or fantastical thing like private, you know, execution squad or uh, right wing militias or whatever, that's not what's going to replace. They're just going to federalize law enforcement and ensure that liberal bureaucrats have control over them and some DMV American is telling them what to do. And you're going to think like, wow, so glad that we came one, uh, shook hands with BLM one struggle. And instead it's like BLM is like, okay, we're going to make sure that all these cops arrest you and ensure that you can't do anything with your life and harass you while they allow us to rob you and mug you and murder you. And yeah, that's what's it. So that's my go off juice. That's a lot of talk about the trucker convoy. I am positive about it. Um, I think it is a white pill, um, but I am uh, disappointed <laughs> that it is leading to further idiocy among the American right. But hopefully the American right takes valuable lessons for that. So that's it. We're now going to move on to the second topic, which is the Ukraine situation. So I think the most important thing is that it's a very fluid situation that changes Literally uh, from hour to hour. So what I may say on specifics may be out of date by the time you're listening to this. I mean, if you if even if you're listening to this tomorrow, you may be seeing Russian tanks flying through Ukraine. I mean, they could invade. I mean, people uh, that I've been talking to have been saying that it's likely to have the invasion Tuesday, um, which is tomorrow. And if you're listening to this on Tuesday, it's like today. I could be wrong about that. You could be like they've had peace. They created peace. So. A situation really is in flux, um, and I don't want to get too bogged down in specifics. So I guess I want to take really big picture. I mean, from what I'm seeing right now, uh, as all you guys know, I was like saying there's not going to be invasion. They're just going to try to ring concessions, uh, but they're not ringing any serious concessions. Really, what America is offering you, uh, Russia and what U Ukraine is willing to agree is nothing. It is arms control. Like, that's it. They're like, we're going to have arms control and we're going to have transparency about sending our fleets places. And this is really what you want, Russia, right? And it's like, but we're going to make sure that Ukraine never recognizes the independent republics in Donbass, doesn't grant them autonomy, doesn't recognize that Crimea is Russia, and is going to join NATO. Uh, this is... and. We're not going to lift sanctions. We're not going to give you anything, Putin. But we want you to negotiate. We want you to talk. And I think that the talks, uh, I think Russia has now concluded that the talks are totally pointless. And, you know, they might as well invade. Unless Ukraine surrenders. But Ukraine is listening to America. And Ukraine is trying to downplay the situation or trying to be like, oh, we have no reports of threats. Uh, we don't think there's going to be an attack. Uh, 
you know, it's not going to be like that. But, you know, they're trying to make sure that it's like entire population doesn't flee to Poland. <laughs> I mean, like the fact that like Ukraine, like these people are not even really standing up for the country. I mean, a lot of their oligarchs who run the country have already fled. Uh, the U.S. has fled from Ki Kiev or as we're now supposed to call it Kiev. Uh, we have to respect the indigenous culture of Ukraine and call it Kiev. Um, I mean, that's what it said in Ukrainian, but I prefer Kiev. And, you know, maybe after this week, it will be back to Kiev. <laughs> we'll have to see. Uh, and I think with Russia is that they were gonna, they're going to have more of a stronger hand if they invade. And they're just not going to get anything worthwhile. The talks are all just done to stall and to act like that America did everything possible and to threaten Russia more. But they're not really into this. Uh, they had a Putin did a whole press conference with all with all of his cabinet, and all the you know military chieftains and political leaders of, of of Russia were there, and pretty much every person was like saying we must recognize the independent republics in Donbass, which is a republic of Donetsk and, and Luhansk. Even though I think it's, sometimes they pronounce Luhan like with a G and with an H there, so I'm like Lugansk. I, I don't know, <laughs> not Slavic. We're gonna call it Luhansk and whatever, uh, Donets uh, Donetsk and Luhansk. So they want them to recognize that. They're also the even though there's like some of these false flag stuff, and I'm like leery of this. It does seem like Ukraine is making a move into controlling the borders around those independent republics because those borders are supposed to be controlled by Russia. And I think they pulled back due to these um, uh, Minsk protocols or whatever they call them, uh, Minsk Accords, which is like supposed to have like a ceasefire. And it's like, uh, there's like certain parameters around it that Ukraine is not respecting. I don't think the separatists are respecting it either, but whatever. <laughs> and it does seem like the Ukraine is like making incursions into it to control the border around that and to be in a position where they can. Uh, I think some of it may be false flags planted by Russia, but like some of it seems like legitimate. Like they are showing like actual Ukrainian like weaponry and and tanks and stuff. And, you know, maybe it is. Who knows what it is? But all this is being served as a pretext to justify, uh, you know, an incursion into into Ukraine by Russia. And as I said before, none of the negotiations are really what Russia wants. Russia has been clear. Sergei Lavrov, the foreign minister, has been very clear. It's like none of these things are what we want. And even they're saying that the moratorium like America is possibly giving a moratorium on Ukraine joining NATO. But Putin says that's not good enough because it's like, you know, they could join at another time and that's more fitting with America's interests and we still have these other concerns. There are things that America could do, like concessions that, you know, they could lift sanctions. They could say, you know, fleets that we're developing. I think we're like developing like an Arctic fleet or something or, you know, we're having troops around in Eastern Europe or what Russia considers its fear. We could pull them back. But anything like that would be perceived as weakness. I think one thing I need to you know, operate on is like from America's interest, what Biden wants is war probably more so than any other party because for a couple of different reasons. One is that Biden is not able to operate in a way to give peace because after the Afghanistan pullout, which I supported, it was uh, did hurt him politically here. And Republicans are very being very cynical. They'll play whatever side will make give them more political clout and more political points. And they would see that if Biden capitulate or is seen to capitulate to Biden, to Putin and gives Putin what he wants or something that he actually wants, you know, lifting sanctions, you know, we're not developing certain fleet, or we're never going to allow Ukraine into NATO, you know, we recognize Crimea as part of Russia, you know, several of these things, it'll be perceived as weakness. And it'll be perceived as something that will be that Republicans will make political hay out of for the midterms. And right now, the Democrats are facing a all out, uh, <laughs> a really brutal uh, prior, uh, midterms where they're going to get destroyed and there's probably nothing to save them from this uh, result. And, you know, another foreign policy disaster that makes America look weak, uh, so to speak, or gives something ammunition to Republicans he doesn't want to do. 
So the best scenario is just to act tough, give no concessions and let them invade Ukraine and then isolate Russia. And I think one thing they want to do this is that they want to pass these massive sanctions on Russia because they hope that it would cripple Russia's economy and that the isolation Russia would feel would other further hurt Russia. And this would finally lead to the people overthrowing Putin, you know, democratically as what they've as what, you know, the American government has wanted for many, many years and that they would finally be able to attain that by pushing these sanctions on Russia. And they could also and it also make if Russia invaded Ukraine, it would make these Eastern European countries much more loyal, much more dependent on America you know, much less willing to, you know, refuse what the UN and NATO and the European Union are telling them about immigrants and and gay rights and stuff, because they'd all be worried that Russia would come after them next. And so it'd make Eastern Europe more dependent on America. This is America's line of thinking. It isolate Putin and and hurt Russia's economy to the extent that Putin's popularity would go down and that there would be a, a possibility that they could have a color revolution or that elections would not go the way that Putin planned. And it would also, dip, you know, reduce Russia's power in the world. And I think that's what they're, they're thinking of this is. I mean, and the blob absolutely hates Russia. Also, the blob thinks, I think the blob is also convinced that Russia would be bogged down in a messy guerrilla war a la, you know, what happened to them in Afghanistan in the 80s and what happened to them in Chechnya in the 90s and 2000s, which it's not going to it's not going to happen. It's like Ukraine is not Chechnya. Like Chechnya, you know, like the Ukrainians are not into these like vicious clan, like these well-developed clans that, uh, you know, are guided by a Salafist uh, ideology. You know, most Ukrainians are most young male great Ukrainians are working in Poland or a lot of them. I'm not going to say most of them, but a lot of them are, are guest workers in other parts of Europe. Uh, a lot of them are the same as Americans, like in their, in their tastes are just poorer. Uh, you know, they're they're really having to depend, depend on these nationalist militias to fight. I think they would fight to that. And also, as I've said before, you know, Ukraine's terrain is horrible for a guerrilla war. And, you know, they, they it's not it's not ideal guerrilla war uh, territory. Most of the Ukra most of the area that the Russia would probably occupy in this would be the eastern area where a lot of the sentiment is pro-Russia. A lot of those people consider themselves Russian. And they'd be like, oh, well, one corrupt government for another. Who gives a shit? I'm just going about my daily life. They're not going to risk their life for this. This is not like Chechnya or Afghanistan. But the blob convinced themselves that it is. I think the most compelling argument that Ukrainians aren't going to do this is Ukraine has one of the lowest fertility rates in the world. And people always complain, like mock Russia for its fertility rate. Its fertility rate is not that bad compared to the rest of Europe. But Ukraine's is horrible. It's 1.22. I mean, like only like Taiwan and South Korea and a couple of other, like some other, uh, like maybe I think Singapore have like lower uh, total fertility rate and and like r random provinces in, Ca in China like Hong Kong and Mac like the most bugmen places in the world are the only places with lower total fertility rate than Ukraine and some of that I guess is that people that there's like such a high rate of, of out migration that like young people like just move uh, they move away from Ukraine before having their kids from the, there so uh, but that's another thing is like if people like if the situation was really bad, Ukrainians would rather flee uh, than, you know, form guerrilla bands to fight uh, Russia. I don't think I don't think this war would be as devastating as for Russia as Chechnya and Afghanistan were. Uh, I would actually guarantee that it's not going to be as bad as devastating for them. I mean, there may be more sanctions on them and stuff, but in terms of like the cost of like the war itself and casualties, I don't think so. I mean, they lost. um they lost about 15,000 in Afghanistan. Uh, their numbers, their official numbers are over 5,000 in the First Chechen War and about like, I think another 5,000 in the Second Chechen War. Uh, I don't, they'll probably maybe meet those numbers, but this is going to be, um, you know, I don't, I don't think, there'll be numbers that the public can withstand and that'll probably be an easy victory and it'll probably be, and it'll be very popular among the Russian public uh, to, you know, take back Ukraine. Uh, 
or parts of Ukraine. I think because I mean Putin's popularity soared in Russia when he annexed Crimea. It went up to ninety percent. Of course, you know maybe it's a little biased, but by the standards we have, you know, or what data we have, it showed that there was a clear popularity support, and there was a lot of popular support for these independent republics in in Eastern Ukraine. So this would probably be, uh, you know, it probably would be a boost to Putin's popularity if he went along with it. Now, it's not just America that wants, like, no concessions at all for Ukraine. East, mostly, a lot of Eastern European countries don't want any concessions. I mean, Poland and the Baltics don't want any. They want American troops there. They really want American troops to go into Ukraine. I mean, this is such a funny situation. It's like, we're telling Ukraine, uh, we're not sending you any troops Nobody's going to come to rescue you, but do not give any concessions. And Ukraine is just going along with it. It's like, and Ukraine knows that they're going to get crushed. I mean, America is essentially mainly giving them weapons for guerrilla war. They're not giving them really the weapons they need for a conventional ground war. I mean, they do give us some, but a lot of the weapons that we're shipping over now are, are mainly for the the idea that they're going to be in a guerrilla war. Most of the weapons are probably going to be sold off. They're not going to be used in whatever capacity that they're intended for. So we're not really sending them what they want, and we're but we're giving telling them like no concessions. But Ukraine is so dependent on the West to survive in America that they can't do anything without America approving that. And if Zelensky was able to have any degree of independence, he would make a deal with Russia. He'd be like, "Look, we're going to grant autonomy to these Eastern republics. We're going to recognize Crimea as part of Russia, and we're never going to join NATO." And they and maybe we'll agree to a trade a deal to, with Russia because I mean what Russia ultimately wants is Russia wants Ukraine in Russia's sphere. Russia views Ukraine, you know, Russia wants to become a great power again. And if Ukraine is co- completely separated from Russia, completely outside the sphere, and it's this new anti-Russia, you know, they cannot that ability to project itself as a great power is diminished it's it, the ability to do that is greatly it's just not going to happen without ukraine being in the russian sphere and they view the ukrainians as part of their people as a brother people uh the same way they do with the belarusians and they want uh you know they want them to be and they do view it as a great tragedy that ukraine and belarus and all these other former soviet republics were separated from them uh, in the collapse of the Soviet Union, especially Belarus and Ukraine, because they do view those uh, two people as a brother people to uh, ethnic Russians, the Ruskis. And so where is this going to uh, lead up to? Well, <laughs> uh, you know, I, as I say, yeah, likely invasion unless somebody negotiates uh, a deal that gives serious concessions to uh, Ukraine, but by all chances, America's not going to do that because America. I mean, Biden's worried about the midterms and he doesn't want to look weak on the on the on the world stage again, like he did after Afghanistan. Even though I think that was the right thing to do, uh, his poll numbers that was the first time his poll numbers really dropped, and he knows that this is going to be hurt him um, in the in the midterms. So he's not willing to do that. He knows it would be. Uh, pol- disastrous domestically if he gave concessions to Putin maybe if he made peace but it, you know it has to be from a position of strength and what the concessions America would give it would be you know selling out it would be considered like selling out Ukraine or selling out our own defense interests so I don't think that's going to happen uh, Ukraine is just relying on the West and even like Zelensky even if he did make these concessions it would be the end of his uh, presidency because it'd be wildly unpopular among a lot of Ukrainians, and so he would uh, likely lose his stature. And America would be pissed if he made a deal on his own. And he can't make a deal on his own unless the West and America, you know, Western Europe and America approves of the deal. Uh, Western Europe is the only, is probably the party most interested in not having war. Well, Ukraine too, because Ukraine is screwed either direction. But they've decided that, you know, they're, they're, foreign, they're so dependent on foreign nations that they've decided that it's better to be conquered, <laughs> occupied than by Russia, than, uh, than the alternative of not being conquered and occupied Russia. 
Um, you know, and they're de- that's why Ukraine's desperate. It's like, please pass the sanctions now so maybe they reconsider. And they're like, oh, we can't do that. We have to wait till they evade first. Don't worry. Just good luck with the guerrilla war. <laughs> you know, that's what the West is telling them. But Western Europe, I mean, France and Germany and the other countries are like, no, outside of Eastern Europe, outside of Poland and the Baltics, they're like, we absolutely do not want this war. Germany's energy supply depends on on Russia. They, you know, Germany is like the most worried about this because, you know, if America tries to pass sanctions and Germany has to go along with them, you know, they are, um, you know, there's still some uh, cold weeks ahead of us and they're going to have like their energy supply cut off, especially with their green energy uh, ideas that are ensuring they have no domestic energy supply. And now it's all dependent on on Russia and also France doesn't want a war and they want to negotiate. They're trying to have this summit uh, on this. Uh, Biden says he won't join the summit if they invade. So we'll see how that works out, whether it happens or not. But the France and Germany are trying to have peace. And even Germany's like saying like it's insane to invite uh, Ukraine into NATO. And Germany is open to other concessions to Russia, other serious concessions to Russia, but America and Ukraine are not. Uh, so we're in this situation. I'll be seeing what happens with us in Europe. This could be the way America handles this rather than being the blob, you know, having what the blob thinks is going to happen and make Western Europe more dependent on America and stuff. It could have the opposite effect is that, you know, Russia, the sanctions don't really hurt Russia that much. <laughs> Western Europe is so pissed off about their energy situation that become even more anti-America and they're wanting to all remove themselves from NATO and they become more pro-Russia and in response to this because they're like, this is so stupid that we've had to cut off our energy supply in order to please Washington, D.C. So it could all backfire against America. We'll keep an eye on it. Um, This is a very, as I said, this is a very fluid situation. I don't want to discuss too much about it. outside of what it is but i am convinced uh an invasion will happen likely this probably this week if not ever if it doesn't happen this week maybe i think its chances may diminish uh they may you know putin may lose his nerve and and just agree to whatever talks they are but he would look weak if he doesn't invade or doesn't do or if he doesn't invade and doesn't get any serious concessions i think it would be uh you know, hurt Putin, not only globally, but domestically. So I'm convinced he's going to, they're going to go to invasion unless some serious confession concessions are made. As I was recording today, a new, new thing came up with uh, Putin's speech. Putin did recognize the independent republics of Donetsk and Luhansk. Um, So it's likely that does um, move the ball or what's likely going to happen makes invasion or war much more likely because I guess Russia now says any incursions against this territory is going to be uh, against their national national security interests or whatever. And you can very much tell from this um, this speech that Putin delivered at uh, the speech that Putin delivered in um, this afternoon when he was talking about the situation in Ukraine. Uh, a lot of people have commented this, but you could never see a Western leader give this type of speech. This speech was outlining the whole history of Ukraine. It blamed the formation of Ukraine on the Bolsheviks and the Communist Revolution and their desire to break up and destroy the historic great um, Russian nation, I guess, the historic Russian nation, you would say, in their parlance. And he went through all this history of telling about what happened at the end of the Cold War and in the 90s and the 2000s and the security guarantees and what's been going on since 2014 and then outlined this whole historic case that was not filled with platitudes about democracy or human rights or etc. It was about this Western conspiracy to undermine Russia and to make it weak again and to renege on these agreements that were made in the conclusion of the Cold War and how Ukraine is a historically a part of what he considers the Russian nation. They're one people. And then it goes on to these uh, alleged crimes and misdeeds by the Ukrainian government against Russia from, you know, uh, crimes against Russians, uh, various crimes against Ru- One time he said that they like uh, burned to death these peaceful protesters in Odessa. And he's like, we know who these people are and we will punish them. And then he went on and said that they've been pilfering uh, gas and oil and have give, 
given nothing in return for all these great things that Russia is doing. So he laid out this whole case. Uh, the the accuracy of every claim, you know, that's that would take up uh, a whole other podcast. But the speech itself, if you're a Russian speaker uh, or if you're a Russian yourself and you're listening to this and this is like the most you it would have a very powerful effect on you. It would be saying like, look at all these terrible things that they've done. And they're like they're they want to do decommunization, but they are a part of the communist like Ukraine state itself is a result of communization. We will show you what decommunization is. And you're like, oh, <laughs> this is basically a threat to war. And it's saying we're going to punish these people who have been persecuting ethnic Russians in Ukraine. And we're going to punish these people who have burned alive peaceful protesters or oppressed them. And he went through all these lists of grievances and history of it. And the way it was, it was like a very serious speech. If you look at what Biden or, uh, you know, Boris Johnson go through, they never uh, they never have any powerful moments. If any American president did a historic speech, it's about how bad America is. It's like, we are so sorry for the Mexican-American war. We are so sorry for taking Hawaii. We are so sorry for this. While Russia, it's like... We had all these things a part of our of our nation, and we're going to take it back, and they're oppressing us, and we're going to bring justice to these wrongdoers. And it's a very nationalistic speech, uh, full of pride in the nation and, you know, appealing to the people's sense of what their nation should be, rather than ever making apologies. If any historic speech ever comes from America, it's apologizing for what America did, and it's elevating a minority groups to angelic martyr status while the great majority the historic american nation is denigrated and well you did something good in world war ii and that's basically our history uh if an american president ever gives their speech and it's always fixated on these platitudes about human rights and freedom and liberty and it's never getting into like gut punch it's never like a serious historical uh, you know argument for what they're doing or why they're choosing to do this you know some pre american president is never going to give any more insightful analysis of what something happened 100 years ago but putin actually talking about what the bolsheviks were doing in 1917 and 18 with ukraine uh, you know maybe there's up to debate about it but it was like treating the listeners like they're adults as darren Beatty said our president, the only history, they know that the only history that they know is like Harriet Tubman, uh, World War II, uh, maybe the Holocaust, maybe slave, slavery, there's no slavery, and, um, you know, and maybe some like uh, sports figures and entertainment figures. And that's all they can do. They're never, and it's like when Biden talks about history, all he talks about is Satchel Paige. And it's like, let me tell you about Satchel Page. It's like, why the fuck do we care about Satchel Page? Like, stop talking about Satchel Page. Like, this is not relevant to the vast majority of the population, but he always wants to talk about Satchel Page. And that's like the only history digression outside of World War II are apologizing for America's alleged racism. So it was a very uh, um, eye opening speech, to say the least. And it is more of a sign that. Russia is likely going to invade. Uh, I recommend people to read the whole thing. I was reading most of the snippets from Russians with um, with Attitude podcast. Uh, I've been on their podcast before. We're supposed to have them on soon enough. Um, they are they're very intelligent uh, figures, and they were transcribing the whole thing and putting it into English. I'm sure there's going to be some English translations out there of transcripts, and I highly recommend reading it. It is a very fascinating speech and it's something that you could have never seen a Western leader give. And it was very much like a hype speech for a, before a big game, like a, you're going to the football team, and it's like, these guys are our enemies. They beat us and humiliated us last year, but no more. We're going to beat and humiliate this team because we're the best team that there is, and we are not going to let our enemies say this. And our, you know, they're telling us the worst team, but we're going to show them what's wrong. And it's like hyping up your team, like, yeah, let's go out there and, and, and destroy that other team. And that's essentially what Putin's speech was. Um, some people were like saying, this is irrational. He's going mad. And it's like, 
what was there irrational or mad about this speech? I mean, he was very cogent and clear about what he was talking about. He went through historical analysis. He went through their national security concerns, saying that, like, if, you know, Ukraine, if NATO expansion is make is about making Russia weak and making sure it could not develop into or reclaim great power status. And this is why we are concerned about the Ukraine situation. And they're oppressing our people, our ethnic Russians, which... Uh, most Western leaders would never admit that there's any ethnic group uh, under <laughs> underlining their nation is like, oh, uh, ethnic, ethnic Americans are anywhere. Everyone could be an ethnic American. And so there's never a concern about that. And they're, you know, suppressing their speech and culture in ways. So I thought it was a very rational speech rather than an irrational speech like some people are saying. That is it on the Ukraine situation. Now for the cognitive elite question. As a reminder, you too can get the power to ask me questions or suggest guests and topics if you sign up for the Convalete option at Highly Respected's Substack at HighlyRespected.Substack.com. And also make sure to sign up for the IQ supplements at Highly Respected's Substack. This question comes from Jerome and it's about uh, the trucker convoy and the suppression of it. He asks... Uh, hi, Scott. I imagine you will probably talk about the truckers on Monday. You are correct. If you do, could you give us some attention to the bank accounts of the protesters being frozen? Uh, and I did talk about this, but he had some very specific questions. It's like the possible one, the possible impacts on Bitcoin, if any, the possible impact on trust in those financial institutions, if any. Three, lastly, if you think there is any relation to the release to the recent FBI task, a team tasked to investigate Bitcoin uh, with those. The possible impact on Bitcoin, you know, it's both make more people to get crypto, even though they were freezing crypto accounts with that. And the task force and the investigation, it, this, the fact that they're you the, the trucker convoy was using Bitcoin and others is going to make people or is going to make more governments, particularly the American government, go after it more and investigate it more. I could also see Canada investigating crypto and other things. And as already the FBI task force is going into this, yeah, they are going to make it a more of a focus. I guess that in any time that there's disruption to the crypto market, uh, you know, the numbers come down. <laughs> Money comes down and there's a loss in value. I don't know how much of a loss in value it's going to this is going to cause a disruption in the market is going to cause it, you know, and the fact that they were able to freeze a lot of these crypto accounts. And I know they weren't able to do some that, because, you know, I'm not a full on crypto expert here. Uh, I have some opinions about crypto that might upset uh, my listeners. But I think that with the, the crypto being frozen and the fact that like, oh, even even if I haven't done a crime, the government can still take can go after this and take it down. That does lose trust in these institutions. I think with financial institutions in general, you know, banks, uh, investment firms, etc., that a lot of these people are going. People aren't fully realizing the extent because most people who are banking or whatever, they don't they feel that they don't have to have a worry about this. Like they can have their political beliefs and whatever, and that's not gonna their bank account is never gonna be attacked. There are examples of this, but this is like the fringe of the dissidents. It's only a few dissidents who've had problems with banking and financial institutions, and even with the crypto market. I think with uh, uh, Nick Fuentes, he, I mean, not only was his bank account sto uh, stolen by the government, I believe he was kicked off of some of the Bitcoin or the crypto markets as well. Uh, don't quote me on that. <laughs> well, you are going to quote me on that. I think he was kicked off Coinbase, if I'm not mistaken. And a couple of maybe a few others. But so that's like just with your political opinions. But most people feel like they don't have to worry about that because I'm not a public position like Nick Fuentes. I'm not out there with the truckers or whatever. But I think if you're seeing just ordinary people who maybe made a, fifth, a donation in crypto and then their crypto account is frozen <clears throat> and there's a high number of that, you know, I think that does create a lot of worry and volatility. And there there is allegedly a bank run uh, in Canada, I don't know how much that was true because they were saying the banks were, you know, frozen out uh, for a few hours on one of these days. I don't know how true that is. People like to say spread these things. But, you know, I think if they're seeing that, like, their politics can come at a financial cost and that all this money that they've saved and worked on, it can be taken away from them. And it's like, when is this stuff going to be returned to them, too? 
you know, there's like a story I saw where this family, they were accused of some crime or they were to be investigated and they had their all their assets that was worth a million dollars frozen and it turned them into power and it made them sink into poverty. Uh, the government still hasn't given their money back and money's, the government still hasn't given Fuentes' money back. And when are, when are these ordinary Canadians going to receive their money back? No, that's, that's a question. But the point is intimidation is like people, you know, really do fear that prospect of being turned into like one day they have all this money and have all these things they've saved up and worked on. And then right that government takes it away because they say that you're a, uh, you're a terrorist or whatever. And it's hard to get that money back. There's like no real way. It's not like you can fill out a form and you go through this process to get your money back. They can hold it as long as they want. And they're doing that here. And I think that's going to be with Canada. So it's like, I just think that crypto, you know, it is one solution, but it's not foolproof. And as we're seeing here with this, they will figure out ways to take your money. And the fact if it's like all into crypto, it's going to increase their efforts to go after crypto. And I think after the trucker convoy, you're going to see even a bigger push from Western governments to stamp down on it. So that's my answer to that question. And that's it for today's Highly Respected uh, a lot of these things are probably going to be developed. Hopefully, my takes are still fresh uh, tomorrow, <laughs> but depending on how things happen. But that is it for today. We're going to have a great IQ supplement later this week. We're going to have a special guest back, and it's somebody you many people have been requesting to come back on the show. So tune in for the IQ supplement later this week. So until next time, stay respected. <music>